Hi, Alex Perry here, Chinese Medicine Digital Magazine. I've got with me Deborah Betts. Thanks for Hi. coming on, Deborah. Right. And uh, we're at the Wolfus Conference here in Darling Harbour in Sydney. And uh, you've been presenting this weekend, yes? Yeah. Tell me a little bit about, um, I know the work that you do largely around pregnancy and, and birth and preparation. Tell me a little bit about where you fit into the picture in terms of helping us to, to educate the Chinese medicine community and the broader community about birth. Well, I would just like to encourage practitioners to think about what they can do for pregnant women. My uh, I, philosophy on it really was my own ex personal experience was that there were a lot of pregnant women who acupuncture has the tools to help that actually don't even know what we can do for them. So in my practice, although I did see fertility uh, patients, uh, the majority of my practice quickly became pregnancy based and that was really working through the uh, referrals from midwives and word of mouth from, from within the pregnancy community because there are quite a few things that um, women are told they need to put up with. Back pain, insomnia, hemorrhoids, vulval varicoses, heartburn, that actually we have really useful uh, treatment for and so the word quickly gets around about what you can do. So to me I think a lot of practitioners are worried or concerned about treating pregnant women and I just think if you look at the physiology of a pregnancy body and have a rationale for your TCM diagnosis, that there's a huge potential to offer these women treatment. Where does that fear come from, do you think? Because I've heard that too, but both as a student and, and since graduating, people are afraid of, of even touching a woman once she's, once she's pregnant. What, why are we afraid? Well, part of it was when I was trained, I was given these lists of points. <laughs> Not to use this. And not to use this. It didn't have a good rationale. So some of these points to me do have a good rationale because they're points that I would like to talk about, not as forbidden, but as encouraging efficient labour. So there are obvious times when you don't want the uterus to contract, when you don't want the cervix to dilate. So you don't want to encourage hormonal responses that may be really useful. So to me, there is a set of points that we were taught of as forbidden that actually come from the classical text where they said, the woman's having trouble, of a difficult labour, you rush in, you do these points and you will encourage the body to, to do what it can with labour. So those points we will know them very large just a few between 6 to 60, etc. Um, are points that were used historically when you got you had a difficult labour. And I think that's very valid to think about that. Not that you can't use them but you need to take into consideration that they may have this encouraging labour effect. Uh, but then there are another set of points that don't seem to have any rationale. So they're just given out as lists, don't do this, this is too downward moving, this, but you, would, it's not induct, you wouldn't use it to induce labour. What sort of points are you thinking in that category? Liver 3, yeah. stomach 36, gallbladder 34. I actually, when I surveyed practitioners, asked them to put down points that they felt uncomfortable using. And it was quite a list. Some of them have quite a judgy points, kidney mm. six, lung seven, points that actually don't have a rationale for encouraging labour. Mm. So they may have another rationale, but it's possibly not an encouraging labour rationale. That's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I think we, we think about, at least we're told, that stomach 36 is too stimulating for the pregnant body. Liver three is too moving. Yeah, I would ask who, to, who said that. Well, the unit, well, often I think it comes from the school, which I, I don't know where it comes from. Yeah, prior to but that. The, to me it's like looking at the rationale for the point. Why yeah. would that be a problem? It's a good question. Now I can see, I personally do think there are, is a good rationale for points like bladder 32 mm. and bladder 21 and bladder 60 because I've seen what they do in labour. Absolutely. And all stomach 36 does is tonify the woman. That's right. In labour. It doesn't actually... Which can't be good for most, you know, most mute to meet a pregnant woman who doesn't need a bit of tonifying. Yeah, so, t so you can see changes in labour, but it's the, the changes that you would expect. They're not necessarily increasing contractions, except that the woman was tired and exhausted and you can help to labour more efficiently. Whereas I think other points do have a certain physiological base. They might uh, work with oxytocin, they might stimulate uh, certain cervical ripening points, must stimulate some sort of hormonal responses in the body. And I think that there are times in a pregnant body when those mechanisms are being switched on. Oxytocin receptors, oxytocin is being released, so then acupuncture may have a much more, uh, not much more, but have a different effect at 37 weeks and maybe early in pregnancy than it may do in the middle of pregnancy when those oxytocin receptors are not switched on. So I think we just have to think about it and have a rationale for what we're doing. And 
that that would take away some of the fear. If you know what's happening at the different stages of pregnancy physiologically, when these hormones come into being, when the baby moves down, um, then you can have a good ration, a good feeling about, well, this is a safe treatment at this time. Yeah, but this maybe not reason. at this time. Yeah. And I think it's a rationale for what you do. So I think that's part of where that fear comes from, is just being given randomness without understanding what it can be and not wanting to do any harm. So you try and follow all the lists, but then that's just confusing. Instead of having a good idea of what's yeah. useful or not. And then the second thing that I think is that acupuncture isn't written a lot about in China for use. So in pregnancy, it's not written about in the same way that fertility treatment is. And it's not integrated into the diagnosis. So there's excellent books by people like Charlotte Worth, Flourishing In, where she, re and, uh, where she really traces this whole uh, how women were involved in Chinese medicine. And we're looking at the fact that we only have the written documents that are left. If women practitioners treated a lot of problems in pregnancy, even if they were using acupuncture, we don't have these written documents. So therefore that meant our teachers that came with acupuncture into the West only used herbs. That's what they saw being used in China, they didn't use acupuncture. Acupuncture still does not appear to be used very much in China for problems in pregnancy. And yet it seems to be a very effective tool. So working with the midwives, they are treating high blood pressure, they are treating hysteric positions, they are treating a lot of conditions that normally they would only use herbs for in China. So I think that's a double whammy because we don't we have to start documenting what we're doing develop our own treatment rationales because we're not going to be dived back into the historical texts. Because it's not there. It's not there. Yeah. Where, whereas it is there for gynae. Mm. You know, the whole idea of moving blood and you know what that means from a TCM perspective mm. and the acupuncture and herbs you can use for that. But it's not there for pregnancy. Mm. They don't they don't discuss pregnancy, pregnant bodies. That's interesting, isn't it? So the historical, the classic literature is just because men were like species of today, it appears like. They, you waited until there was a problem, well, a woman tried to look after a woman and then the problems, and then this, there was a problem, and the specialist came in and did his little magical things and hopefully helped, and they dealt with abnormal conditions, right, you know, when people were fitting a pregnancy. So, ra so rather than taking a, let's prepare yeah. a normal woman for a normal pregnancy. They weren't involved in that aspect. It doesn't appear from looking at the case histories and people who can read. I can't read Chinese, so mm. I'm relying on you know scholars who can read Chinese texts. Mm. Uh, people like Sabina Wilms and um, uh, Charlotte Fur to actually discuss that, that it doesn't appear it was a normal physiological treatment. They just saw the emergency cases, um, and they were. I like the quote. You know, they were heroic practitioners who saved the day because the midwives did everything wrong. It sounds like the modern model. And I'm quite happy. I'm quite really happy. I come from a neonatal nurse background. I'm quite happy to leave the you know the, the serious medical conditions to the specialists. And they can rush in and save the day. Absolutely. I want to work with preparing the body to get the most beneficial pregnancy that it can and supporting it in a preventative medicine aspect. And I think that's a, that's a real shift in mindset, particularly for our Western counterparts, isn't it? Because it's, you know, I think about um, obstetricians in general, it's probably an unfair generalisation, but it's all about you know what happens when something goes wrong. But then that's that's translated throughout a normal pregnancy as well by you know okay well let's let's make sure nothing goes wrong by doing these interventions yeah. much earlier on. So it, it's kind of it's a real real shift in mindset in term in terms of that relationship between you know what you're doing, what we're doing, and and, and the, what the obstetricians and midwives are doing. Are you finding in general that they that they're on board or they're coming across or is there still a little bit of us and us and them when it comes to the obstetric model? I think it's a matter of having a scope of practice where you feel comfortable in and what's your role and what's their role. I, I start out, I come from a nursing background so and I was a neonatal nurse. So I, I have sympathy with the fact that I want these people around if things go wrong. Absolutely. Um, and I do come from a base that they want, they get into, people get into medicine because they want to help people. And they do believe that they're doing the best, that this is the best way to help people. So I think there was initially, there was a lot of resistance, not from the midwives, because they saw the problems being helped. But it is a little bit weird that if you spend a long period of your life studying, 
and you have there are problems that you encounter that you still don't have good solutions for, to have someone come in and say, oh no, we tr- we can help. Um, I can understand their resistance to thinking, well, you haven't spent seven years studying medicine and we still don't have solutions for these problems. Uh, so I understand that resistance, but it, it comes, it goes away with patient feedback. And I think the important thing is it takes a lot longer than I would have thought, years and years and years. Um, and it's not one or two miraculous cases, it's that they've been brought down to placebo or, you know, oh, regression to the mean, that would have got better anyway, or that really wasn't preeclampsia, even though the blood, liver blood enzymes were elevated, that can't really have been that. Um, it, it, what happens is it's just after 50 of these, it gets harder to think that's just, and then after 100, it just becomes normalised. So we now have a hospital clinic in, you know, in, in a hospital in New Zealand where we were invited in and we run uh, two rooms two days a week. Uh, it's run through the New Zealand school, so they provide me and somebody else as a supervisor. Jane's actually here if you wanted to talk to her about... You know, Jane Littleton? No, so no, no. Uh, 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 Jane, who's the supervisor. Okay, the, the, but I can absolutely. That'd be cool. To her. So she's been working for seven years um, in the hospital clinic. And maybe she could talk about being a young practitioner mm-hmm. and working with pregnancy. Yep. Um, so we have supervisors and we work with the students in the hospital mm-hmm. based system. And that, I would have thought that would have taken a cur- te- so 10 years ago. And it didn't. It occurred four years ago. So it's just. But it's occurred, so yeah, it's, it is it's happening. It's just a slow process of making it so normal that it doesn't become a big deal anymore. 